The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show. On this almost Christmas day, almost, almost there. Tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's uh, the night before Christmas, I guess. Christmas Eve. Uh, so I thought we'd do a show today about the moral is the practical. Is the practical the moral? What does that even mean? Um, kind of a positive show about morality, hopefully. Uh, and then also talk about benevolence. What does it mean to talk about benevolence? Uh, what did Ayn Rand mean, I mean, mean by benevolent universe? Um, you know, what role does benevolence have in human life? Is benevolence a virtue? If so, what kind of a virtue? Why isn't it one of the seven virtues? So all things, morality, benevolence, stuff we'll talk about today uh, in honor of Christmas. Hey, Thomas Shoebottom is here. Hasn't been, hasn't been around for a while. Um, and uh, all right, so we'll talk morality, charity, any anything, any questions you have about the objective ethics, uh, and we're afraid to ask. Today's your opportunity. Jump in, ask them. What about the poor? What about the poor? What about the poor? What about those poor? What about, whatever. Uh, just just uh, uh, jump in, um, and um, and ask questions and. Yeah, you can ask questions about politics. I was going to say no questions about politics, but what the hell? You can ask questions about politics. You can ask questions about anything. Um, so here's the here's the um, yes to ask questions. You have to use super chat. Uh, super chat is open, uh, and twenty dollars twenty dollar questions get priority as they always do. And we've got our same goal as we always have, 600 bucks. But it's kind of Christmas. So if you guys want to go to $1,000, I'm game. There's no reason to stop at 600. It is Christmas after all. Uh, but I'll try not to bug you too much about money during the show, but make sure to use the Super Chat feature to ask questions, to support the show, to support everything we do. Um, next show will be on Sunday. So the day after Christmas will be uh, a hangout. If you uh, are a $25 monthly supporter of the show and you'd like to be in the Hangout, $25 or more, uh, then and you haven't got an email, you should have received an email, look in your junk folder, find an email uh, with the login information for the Zoom. If you don't have it, you can uh, email me or email Angela and uh, we'll get you the, the, the Zoom credentials to come on over and hang out with us. Uh, the day after Christmas, uh, and um, and just have some fun, bring some eggnog, or some uh, alcohol, or whatever it is that you prefer, and uh, we'll just do questions and answers, and and try to have a lot of fun uh, the day after Christmas, and then we'll get back to serious stuff. All right, so we'll have a show on Sunday, and we'll have another show on Tuesday and on Thursday, and that'll be it for 2021. And then we'll, we'll go into the 2022 cycle. All right, Stephen writes, true individualists are the most benevolent. Merry Christmas, you're on. Thanks for the show. Merry Christmas to you, Stephen. Merry Christmas to everybody on here. Michael says, Merry Christmas, great show topic. What's the best way not to be a prisoner of your past without repressing emotions? Um, all right, we will get to that. Let me copy that question over. Good question. Uh, but that's deep question. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jeffrey says he won't stop at 600. Cool. <laughs> I'm excited. I hope the restaurant is uh, managing to stay open. A lot of the restaurants here in Puerto Rico are closing because uh, staff are falling sick. And we had two, two of my favorite restaurants have had a, stay, have had a close because uh, staff... Uh, got COVID and they had to shut down. So I hope Jeffrey that uh, you guys are running uh, are running strong, um, in spite of the craziness of this COVID COVID not COVID COVID epidemic. 
Um, all right, uh, so Jeffrey, good to see you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, we can also talk about Christmas, or we can leave the Christmas talk to Sunday. Why Christmas is such a great holiday. Why Ayn Rand really like Christmas. Why I like Christmas. Why Lynn Peikoff uh, like Christmas and, and always had interesting things to say about Christmas. Uh, so we, we, we can talk about all that as well. All right, so the question on the table today. Um, oh, Jeffrey says that he had COVID and he had to close the restaurant. That's why he's here. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I, I, I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, and I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you're all better now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, everybody's getting COVID. I, I think at the end, uh, everybody will have had COVID. It looks like, except me, I'm the only one who seems to resist COVID. Uh, but uh, it looks like everybody is going to have it. So, Jeffy, sorry you had COVID. Sorry you had to close the restaurant for it. I'm glad uh, you're feeling better, and hopefully you'll be able to open the restaurant up again soon. But, yeah, restaurants are really taking a hit with COVID because not only uh, because the staff, uh, you know, you're exposed to a lot of people. There's a lot of interaction, and, uh, and, and, and the staff are getting hit. And, um, yeah, that is... Uh, that is not good for, for the restaurants, and it's not good for somebody like me who is so dependent on restaurant for their eating. Uh, what would I eat without, if there were no restaurants, what would I do? I, I'm not sure exactly. Stefan says, Stefan Petit says he has COVID too. Uh, my theater is closing for a month and a half due to the outbreak. What kind of theater? Uh, so it, it looks like uh, a lot of my nistas have COVID, so... Uh, All right, so let's see. Okay, let's get to the topic of the day. Um, uh, thanks, Thomas. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Shazbot and uh, Michael. Uh, we'll get to all those questions in due course. I see Shazbot is um, Shazbot is a, uh, a, a, a related to the topic uh, question. But all right. So yes, I'm glad to see the questions coming in. Glad to see people are, are pitching in 20 bucks or more uh, for the questions. That's great. Uh, hopefully, we'll make our, uh, our goals for today. All right, so you often hear the question, and it's a question that's very prevalent in the culture, and it's a question that comes up a lot, and, and particularly among non-religious people or from religious people to non-religious people. And that question is, why be moral? Why be good? What's the point? What's, you know, you know, you don't believe in God. You don't believe there's some authority watching over you and judging you. You don't believe in an afterlife. So why be moral? Why adhere to principles to guidelines, to pursue, pursue particular values and, uh, you know, and act on, on particular virtues. What's the purpose, right? And for most people, if they're asked that question, they kind of shrug. They don't really know. Well, this is how I was raised. This is how I was brought up. Um, or... You know, this is what God says, or this is what the dogma is, or this is what I'm supposed to do. But why? And indeed, the culture and the world around us has a very, very narrow view of morality. So morality, according to the culture, according to our religions, according to many of our philosophers, it, it applies only to one realm in human life, and that is our interaction with other people. So uh, what does morality mean? It means be selfless, at least somewhat, not too much, a little bit. Be uh, kind and friendly and good and once in a while sacrifice for other people. Make sure other people are okay. Uh, you know, help the poor, help others. That is to most people, and that's to the culture, and that's to the world, 
what morality is. And then there is a real valid validity to the question, well, why be moral? Why should I be nice to other people? Why should I sacrifice? Why should I be selfless? Why should I place the well-being of other people above my own? And there is no answer to that. And that's why the question of why be moral and the idea that, I don't know, atheists can't be moral, or atheists can't be moral, but there's no real reason for them to be moral, is so prevalent because there's a sense in which the conventional view of morality, the view of morality as sacrifice for others, care about the well-being as others more than you care about your own well-being or equally or the same level. Why? And this is really where Objectivism and, and certain other moral views, but, but not many, but certainly objectivism is truly unique and truly revolutionary. Morality, of course, is not about others primarily. There's one virtue out of seven that has to do with other people, and that's the virtue of justice. The other virtues have to do with you. And if you think about what morality is, morality is a guide to living. Why should I be moral? Because I want to live. It's a guide to living a particular kind of life, a successful life, a prosperous life, a life of value, a life of flourishing, a life suitable to a human being, to a being of cognition, a being of reason to the rational animal. So why be moral? Because I want to live a good life. Because I want to be happy. Because I want to make the most of my life. The objectivist uh, ethics is a guide book, a map to how to live a good life, how to be successful, how to be happy. And indeed, that's what morality should be. You know, I've often said that if you want to argue about this particular virtue or that particular virtue that Ayn Rand presents, that's great. If we can accept the idea that morality's purpose is to guide human beings towards happiness, towards success, first of all, to survive, but to survive as the rational animal, as a human being, with everything that that implies, then why should I be mock? Because I want to live that kind of life. I mean, it seems pretty awful not to be mock. Why would anybody want to live, to not live that kind of life? So the reason to be moral is, if you will, because it's practical. If, by practical, you mean that it is life-enhancing, it's pro-life, it, it supports life, it supports the life of a rational being. And why does it do that? What is the magic sauce? What is the magic sauce? Magic, I put in quotes, of course. That, that, you know, produces this result that morality leads to happiness, that morality is practical, and that what is practical is moral. Practical assuming that you mean by practical lead to happiness, lead to long-term well-being. Well, the magic sauce is how the morality is derived and how the, how the morality, if you will, is conceived, and how the morality is applied. So the objectivist morality, Ayn Rand's view of, of ethics, is not dogmatic. 
It's not deductive. It's indeed inductive. It starts with the idea that the purpose is to live. The purpose is to live successfully, to live well, to live consistent as a rational being. And of course, she, she presents kind of the inductive case for why we are rational being, why reason is our means of survival, our basic means of survival, as Lena Peacock does in OPA. That is, if we want to survive, we have to use reason. And, and why? Why is that? Where does she get that from? How do, you, how do you know that you have to use reason in order to survive? You look. You observe. You study history. You look at how people live. You look at what success requires. You look at the products that are necessary for human existence. Whether it's hunting, agriculture, electricity, computers, and you ask yourself, where do all these come from? What do all these necessitate? How did human beings create this? And no other species comes close. What is it that makes it possible for human beings to hunt in spite of the fact that we're weak, pathetic creatures with no fangs or claws, we're slow? How do, how do, we, how do we hunt? We use our mind. We build weapons. We build traps. We develop hunting strategies, we work in teams, we communicate with one another. We use our senses to perceive the world, but we can conceptualize. We can integrate those sense perceptions. We can integrate those percepts into abstractions. And we can use those abstractions to better inform our lives and to shape, ultimately, the world in which we live. So everywhere you look, if you're looking for it, you can see the role of reason in man's life. You can see the importance of reason. You can see that man survives at the very, very fundamental biological level. He survives by using reason. There's no food without reason given the kind of being we are. Not every animal needs reason in order to survive. Human beings need reason in order to survive. So reason being the primary value in, uh, sorry, the primary, the primary value in the objectivist ethics. It's not dogma. It's not, oh, reason's important. It's not revelatory. It's induced from observing human success over hundreds of thousands of years. It's induced by looking at the Industrial Revolution and seeing the role of reason in mass production, the role of reason in raising a standard of living, the role of reason in cre wealth creation, the role of reason in healthcare and, 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 and extension of life expectancy. So, the reason, if you think, so go by reason. Reason is our primary value, is, you know, the, at the core of Ayn Rand's uh, ethics. Is that practical? Well, yeah, it's practical because that's how we got it. We, we didn't get it from a revelation. We didn't get it from dogma. Now we have to test it. We got it from observing facts in reality. We got it by inducing what works in reality. And now we can say, okay, what does reason imply? Well, we have an active mind. We're rational. That's our number one virtue is rationality. But what does rationality require? Well, it requires commitment to facts. Well, that's honesty. Now, you could say that that's deduced from the idea of rationality, but it's also induced from observing the way people behave, the kind of trouble they get when they lie, the kind of trouble they get in particular if they lie to themselves, undermine their own capacity to think, undermine their own capacity to reason, and therefore suffer the consequence of their lives.
So the virtues, every one of them, uh, uh, independence, well, nobody else can think. Your, your brain, your mind is yours. Nobody else can think for you. There is nobody else. Nobody else can eat for you. So yes, you can, you, you, in a sense, deduce from the idea of rationality is your primary virtue, the need to be independent. But again, you also see it in the world out there. You find it in what is successful. Who are the successful people out there? Who are the people who live good lives? They're people who are independent thinkers. They're independent actors. They're people who engage with the world using their own mind, their own values, their own standards. Not subjective, matched by reality, you know, guided by reality, but independent. So it's, um, the practicality of Rand's morality is baked in. It's because of where the morality comes from. See, Christian morality is not practical. And it wasn't derived from human experience. It wasn't derived from what works or doesn't work to achieve a goal. What goal? What's the goal of Christian morality? God, Jesus, sacrifice. So if that's your goal, then yes, it matches, but Practical means success. And Christian morality, there is no standard of success. Afterlife, that's not a standard of success. You're just supposed to do it because you're supposed to do it. It's dogma. Happiness in the afterlife. And no measure of that. We can measure it. We can know it exists. There's, no, there's nobody coming back and saying, yeah, this worked, that didn't work. Uh, you know, the, beauty, the beauty of happiness in this life is it's testable. We can live it. We can experience it. We can correct path. We can try things and, whoops, that didn't work. Try again. Try something else. So, Rand's morality sets out with a goal to be practical. And because it's based on reason and rationality, the measure of that practicality is reality. The place we look for it. The place, you know, the, the place we go to in order to figure out What's going to work and what's not going to work is reality. So if I ask you, you know, uh, how do you, you know, uh, uh, is, this, is this business plan likely to work or not right? in business? Well, based on your experience and kind of the business principles you have derived from success or failure from businesses, you look at the business plan, you compare it to those kind of principles, and you go, you know, based on my experience and based on my knowledge, this business plan is, practi this business plan is practical because it, it follows the principles that are, lead to success in business that people have tried. Or you might say, it's not. Or you might say, this is new and interesting. I, I haven't seen this before. I don't know. It'd be interesting if you try it. We'll learn a lot from trying it. So once you have that goal, now it's a question of, once you have that goal of, you know, in, in the case of morality, success at living, you've got principles that are time-tested and that are consistent with your other values. For example, if reason is the prime value because you've identified it as the core for human existence, for human survival, then all the other values and virtues have to integrate with that. It can't be 
that you have things that are contradictory? Where's the practicality? Where's the success? Where's the, where's the survival in that? Oops, I've fallen behind here. So the moral is the practical because that's what morality sets out to be, a proper morality. A proper morality is a guide to living. And again, the details we might disagree on, we might disagree on application, we might disagree on specifics. But if the goal is what is, now we know what the purpose is, and the purpose is to be practical. And the practical is the moral. Partially, what we, partially how we learn what moral is, is by looking at what has worked, i.e. by looking at what was practical, in the sense that it worked. And then deriving a principle from the things that worked. All right, hopefully that's helpful. You'll let me know, I guess. Let's look and see at um, the topics. Can you discuss uh, what benevolence we're going to do later? Uh, I'm going to do that later. I'm going to do that later. All right, Liam says, for 50 bucks, Liam says, the most practical concept Ayn Rand taught me was to go to the facts first, not the argument. What facts support your view and can you integrate those ideas? She's the only philosopher I know that advocating looking at reality, not other people. I, I, I think somebody like Aristotle was focused on looking at reality, not at other people, right? But yes, I think that's absolutely what Ayn Rand teaches you. So the question is, you know, why do we need morality? We need morality because we don't know automatically how to live, how to survive, how to thrive. We need principles to guide us. Where are we going to get those principles? From reality, from the facts of reality, from what works and what doesn't, what is uniquely human, and what makes it possible. You know, and that points us in the direction of reason. Purpose, self-esteem is the primary values, because those are things that when we look around are required in order to just basically survive. And it's suddenly required in order to thrive. You don't see successful people in any productive realm that are not, that do not follow reason, that do not have self-esteem, they do not have a purpose. So those are all tied up together. But the way we get to them is by observation, by looking at the facts. So absolutely, uh, Liam, it, 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 it is all about identifying the relevant facts and then integrating and coming up, coming up with principles from the integration of the facts, from the generalization, from the... From, from the generalization that you come from, from that integration. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Zev, uh, let's say, friend Harper writes, I heard you mention you aren't great at gift giving. That is true. Uh, easy mode for gift giving is really long charging cables or practical conveniences, like an adjustable one-person table that folds up small. My gift to you is this $50 Merry Christmas. Thank you, Fred Harper. Yeah, I find cash the easiest gift to give. <laughs> it's, it's very easy. It's very practical. It's, it's, it's very mobile. Uh, it's very fungible. It, it's the perfect gift. It's the perfect gift. All right, John, with 80 bucks Australian. Uh, what are your thoughts on the book, The Creature of Jekyll Island by Edward Griffin? Thanks, Yaron. Merry Christmas. You have changed my life for the good. I appreciate that, John. Thank you. That's my Christmas gift is, is the recognition. Um, I don't know. I don't know The Creature of Jekyll Island. I mean, I remember vaguely reading it, certainly a, a kid's version of it, but I don't remember the story. 
I don't remember the story, so I, I, I apologize, but I just don't have thoughts on it because I, I, I can't, I'm sure, I, I remember the, the cover of the kids' version that I read to my kids, and I can't remember the actual book, which is frustrating. So I put it aside. If, I, if my memory comes back to me, then I will definitely re-engage on that one. Um, let's see. Um, I anthro, anthro, anthropomorphize altruism. Thinking of it as the doting husband who always gets his wife her tea and then it turns out he's been poisoning it. It's a trick. Don't fall for it. Yes. I mean, altruism is a trick. It's a trick to get control over you. It's a trick to... Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a trick to undermine you. Altruism, but it's worse than a trick. It is, it's a form of underlying and undermining all life. It, it's fundamentally at its core, it's anti-life. It says your life doesn't matter. Your life is not worthy of your effort. Your life is not worthy of your thought. Your life is not worthy of your focus. That's what altruism tells you. It is poison because it's destructive to you because it tells you your life is worthless. And it, it's, it's ultimately destructive to everybody around you because, you know, altruists resent the altruism. You can't be human and not resent the fact that you're expected not to care about yourself. You expected to care about everybody else, but not about yourself. I mean, even Mother Teresa was, you know, was, was super unhappy, frustrated, bitter, resentful, unfriendly, treated people horribly. Why? Because I'm sure what was going on in her head, and you can find this in her diaries, is why am I doing this? Why are people out there living a life and, and I have to sacrifice? And why am I sacrificing for these people? What, what did I get out of it? And, and do they appreciate me? They don't appreciate me. So what's the point of all this? And altruists, altruists have this to some degree or another, so they always come out bitter, resentful, nasty, and they poison all the, all, the, all the relationships they have around them. So it, it truly is a vicious, horrific, evil ideology. But it's the dominant one. It's the dominant one. All right, let's see. What is the moral status of animals in objectivism? I know animals don't have rights, but could it be consistent with objectivist morality for someone to choose to be a vegan because he feels sorry for the animals? I think if being a vegan is not a sacrifice. If being a vegan is not, uh, for example, uh, destructive for your health or, 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 or makes it impossible for you to eat tasty food or whatever. I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily impossible to imagine uh, an objectivist being a vegan. And I think they're awesome. Um, look, I think the moral status of animals is they're living beings. They have um, status as living beings. A, 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 you know, you, we value life. So, for example... I think it is immoral to torture an animal, to, to, to make it, to, to, to make it uh, inflict pain on an animal for no reason. Not because the animal have rights. I don't think the government should be involved. 
But I do think it's a mall. Why torture an animal? What does that say about you? What does that say about your psychology? That you feel the need to inflict pain on an animal. Now, again, if inflicting the pain on the animal is necessary for your survival, well, sure, you go ahead and do it. But independent of your survival, if you inflict pain when it's not necessary. Why? Other than it, it reflects something psychological about you, about, uh, you know, your, 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 your love of, uh, your hatred of life qua life. Animals are living, conscious beings. And therefore, they should be treated with some respect. That doesn't mean, uh, you know, it means that if you're going to kill animals, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for people who want to kill them quick and fast and, 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 and without much pain. Uh, it means you don't abuse them for, for no reason. It means all of that. So morality does apply. I think it's going far to say, I feel sorry for the animal. What exactly are you feeling sorry for them? Um, so I'm not going to eat them. You know, the animal's going to die at some point. You, you know, it's dying a little earlier. Um, it doesn't, in what sense are you, as long as you're not inflicting pain on it purposefully. Um, people can love their animals deeply. I mean, deeply. And, and, and it, that comes with a whole, you know, moral attitude because, because it's something that is yours. It's something that moves you significantly and they become your, you know, as, as your pet. So I don't know if you could take it all the way to, I choose to be a, a vegan because I feel sorry for the animals, but certainly morality applies to animals because morality applies to animals in terms of how we treat animals. Because how we treat animals says something about who we are as human beings and what, how, what our attitude is to living beings, to life. It also relates to the issue of benevolence, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, let's see. Uh, t -t -t Okay, a lot of stuff on benevolence. Um, let me just see. All right, we're going to talk about benevolence in a minute. Uh, so Jeffy, Jeffy writes, one takeaway from my last reading of Atlas. Trade only in value. I've incorporated that idea into my communication with others and found clarity and efficiency. I also conclude that anything else is a form of manipulation. I think that's right. So you trade value for value. You don't engage with other people uh, uh, emotionally, you know, as, 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 as a, as a, for example, with, with guilt or with negative emotions, or you want to add to you and to them, you want to raise, you want to make your life better. You're pursuing value. And, and I think to, to, to engage with other people without the idea of value it, it can be manipulative. Although, you know, we'll talk about what value you get from just being benevolent to people. Right? Just being benevolent to people. We'll talk about that. So if Jeffrey, if I missed something in terms of um, what you had in mind, maybe you can give us an example. Examples are always good. All right, let's, let's hop over to benevolence, right? Um, I'm looking here if we have like a rundown of where we are with the super chat just to get a sense of where we are. We're like at 475, so only 125. Oh, we're, we're, we're already 100 more than that because we just got $100 from Adam. Uh, Adam says, selfishness on the individual level is moral. Altruism is selfishness of the collective and is far from moral. Well, you can't, I, I mean, I see what you're doing. You, you know, the collective uh, uh, benefits somehow. It advocates for all of you to be altruist so that the collective can benefit. 
but the collective can't benefit. Because at this level, there is no such thing as a collective. So you can't apply these kind of concepts to the collective because the collective doesn't, in that sense, act. So um, the, the collective doesn't want you to be altruistic because the collective, I mean, people, there are people who would like you to be altruistic because they will benefit from you being altruistic, right? Now, is that selfish for them? No. And here, here it's really, really important that we get really clear what Ayn Rand means by selfish. For example, a politician, a power-lusting politician is selfish when they manipulate and they lie and they cheat in order to attain that power. Was Bernie Madoff selfish? And the answer is no, 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 no. The moral is the practical. To the extent that politicians lie, steal, and cheat, they're not being moral. It's not selfish. It doesn't promote their well-being. It doesn't advance. It doesn't advance their well-being. It doesn't advance their life. It hurts their life. So don't use selfishness the way the culture uses it. Uh, my short-term interests. Selfish means, and this is the sense in which the moral is the practical. Selfish means long-term. Selfish means consistent with my life, consistent with the, the, the real meaning of my life, which is my happiness. But if I'm not pursuing happiness, if I'm pursuing an irrational goal like power, if I'm pursuing an irrational goal like money for the sake of money, then that's not selfish. The goal has to be rational for it to be selfish. The goal has to be consistent with human life for it to be selfish. The goal has to be consistent with human well-being for it to be selfish. So the collective, you can never do something altruistic and for it to be selfish in any kind of sense. Because altruism is the exact negation of that long-term goal. It's a negation of your own value. But it's also, don't attribute selfishness to the short-term whims, satisfaction of the group, the politician, the crook, and so on. Power doesn't make you happy. And to the extent that you think it does, check your premises. And again, empirically, look at the world. Look at people who attain power for the sake of power. And they're all, all of them, utterly miserable, pathetic human beings. So be very, very careful because we want to own the word selfish. Because we have a very, very unique and I think true perspective of selfish. Be careful how you use it. Only use it in the context of rational long-term values, not in the context of whim worshiping. Yeah. All right. So, so, so selfishness is John just pursuing whatever you feel like. It's the pursuit of, you know, your own interests. And then the real question is, what are your interests? And that requires reason. That requires rationality. I define power in the political sense. In this context, I define power in the political sense as power over other people. Self-empowerment, of course, self-empowerment is wonderful. But that, you know, and that, that, that comes from self-esteem. So what about this idea of benevolence? How does benevolence fit in to Rand's ethics and Rand's morality? 
And what is benevolence? And, and benevolence is used in two different ways. And I'll just cover both of them quickly. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, I think, the way in which most people use it. And then I, I'll spend most of the rest of the time on your questions, because we have a lot of them. Um, and um, and uh, yep, yeah, and there were a lot of good ones. I'm just checking here something. All right. So there are two senses, two ways in which I invent use of benevolence. I, I mean, they're, they're both consistent, but they're two uh, distinct ways. One is this idea of, of having a benevolent universe premise. A benevolent universe premise is the idea that the moral is the practical, in a sense. It's the idea that short of accidents, short of uh, crazy, random, bad things happening, that if you live the good life, you will be successful and you will achieve happiness. So the benevolent universe is the idea that because of the way we look at the world, because of the way you know, a morality has been uh, uh, induced, if you will, because of the way a morality is logically tied to the facts of reality. It will work. And therefore, our general attitude should be an attitude that says, if I do the right things in life, if I, good to good li if I live a good life, good things will happen. I will be successful. I will achieve prosperity. I will achieve my goals. I will achieve my values. Rather than constantly thinking about all the things that can go wrong, all the pitfalls, all the bad stuff, all the things that can destroy. How do you know it's going to work this time? To quote Leonard Peikoff, the Belembra universe does not mean that the universe feels kindly to man or that it is out to help him achieve his goals. No. The universe is neutral. It simply is, it's indifferent to you, right? You must care about and adapt to it, not the other way around. But reality is benevolent in the sense that if you do adapt to it, if you do think, value, and act rationally, then you can, and barring accidents, you will achieve your values. You will because those values are based on reality. So it's not magic that the universe just accommodates me. It's because I'm accommodating it. It's because I'm going by the facts. It's because I'm using reason. It's because I'm adapting to reality that things will work. That things will work. He continues, he writes, pain, suffering, failure do not have metaphysical significance. They do not reveal the nature of reality. Ayn Rand's heroes, accordingly, refuse to take pain seriously, i.e. metaphysically. You remember when Dagny asked Ragnar in the valley how his wife can live through the months he is away at sea, he answers, I quote just a part of this passage, quote, we do not think that tragedy is a natural state. We do not live in chaotic dread of disaster. We do not expect disasters until we have specific reasons to expect it. And when we encounter it, we are free to fight it. It is not happiness but suffering that we consider unnatural. It is not success but calamity that we regard as a abnormal exception in human life. Now compare this to Jordan Peterson. Compare this to the idea in Jordan Peterson that life, the essence of life is suffering. The tragedy is baked in because we're going to die. That we should expect the, 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 the disaster. Indeed, plan for it. Get married based on 
the idea that life is going to be a disaster and you want somebody who can help you, marry a nurse. And that for, for, for Jordan Peterson, happiness, happiness is the miracle. Happiness is the fluke. Happiness is the abnormality. Disaster is the normal. Disaster is the, the thing that happens all the time. Disaster is what we should expect at every corner. Pain and suffering, that's the essence of life. But that's because he's coming at it from the perspective of altruism. And pain and suffering is the essence of sacrifice. It's the essence of altruism. For objectivism, because we're rational, because we're rational in the sense that we're adapting to reality, we're looking for facts. Our morality is based on human nature and what works in reality and what doesn't. We are confident that if we stick to the facts, we stick to reason, we stick to rationality, we will be successful. And that is the natural state because that's how we survive. That's how we thrive. Peacock continues, this is why Ayn Rand's heroes respond to disaster when it does strike with an instantaneous response, with a single instantaneous response. Action. What can they do? If there's any chance at all, they refuse to accept defeat. They do what they can to counter the danger because they are on the premise that success, not failure, is to be expected. So Rand is an advocate of a, a benevolent universe present because she's an advocate of reason, rationality, and the primacy of reality, of facts. All right. Why is it, why is it inevitable to suffer. I don't know what that even means. And I don't think it's true. I don't think it's inevitable to suffer. I mean, some people, you know, pain, you can suffer through pain, but that's not suffering. Yeah, pain is part of life. But it's not an important part of life. It's not what you build your life around. You build your life around achieving happiness. And yeah, on the way, you're going to bump your knee into something and you're going to feel pain. So what? There's nothing important about suffering other than it should be avoided whenever possible. And for Jordan Peterson, it is what's important. It is what's inevitable. And I'm saying if you act right, if you're moral, if you pursue morality, what's inevitable is happiness, not suffering. So that is one sense in which benevolence is used. And let's go through the second sense, and that is the sense of attitude towards other people, benevolence towards other people. Uh, whether it's kindness or charity or just being nice to people, having a friendly, positive, engaging attitude towards other people. And particularly here, we're talking about particularly towards strangers. That is, why should one open a door to a stranger? Why should one help out somebody who's, I don't know, taking a fall? Why should you engage in a kind of uh, a friendly, positive interaction with people you don't know? And when is it appropriate and how is it appropriate and how much is it appropriate to provide somebody with charity, with, with a, a gift, if you will? So just, just to deal with this point, Harold says, JP is prone to depression. He said, I believe, he is prone to depression. That colors your view towards setbacks in life and turns it into suffering. Yes, but that 
should color your life in the sense that what you should want to do is fix it. Fix the being prone to depression. Depression is not the natural state of man. Now, I know Jordan Peterson is a psychiatrist. So he sees a lot of depressed people. He sees miserable people. He sees suffering all around him. I get it. But I wouldn't want to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist that says, yep, I see suffering and depression all around me. That's a state of nature. You've got to manage it. You've got to find ways to just manage it. Survive through it. Be a man. Just live through it. No, I yell. That's wrong. I want you to teach me as my psychiatrist, my psychologist, how to overcome it. How to get rid of it. How to get back on a path towards happiness. I don't want to be told by, by psychologist to psychiatrist that happiness is impossible that it's a fluke, that if you're lucky, you'll get it. I want him to help me set on the path, set my thinking right and integrate, so my thinking can integrate with my emotions. And if, if we need to use drugs in order to shake up my psychology in order to get me right, fine. Drugs, I have nothing against drugs. But I want to be on a path of success, not on a path of managing defeat. Managing the feet is, what a waste of a life. What's the point? I want psychologists to teach me how to live better, how to achieve. I think that's what a good psychologist does. He doesn't accept defeat. He doesn't accept depression as a state of nature. He doesn't accept suffering as a state of nature. He, he, he builds you up to overcome and set you on a path for success. Yeah, error correction process, Wonder Freeman says. Yes. That's what good psychology, psychiatry is. Now, if you're a determinist, if you believe, eh, you know, we're just born depressed, you're just born with certain chemicals, it's just the way it is, then yeah, that's all you have. But I don't believe that. I'm a free will. <laughs> I know free will exists. I know you can take control over your own life. I know you can manage your own life. And yes, all kinds of things might have caused depression that you have no control over. Okay, let's fix it. I'm going into therapy, wanting to fix this and get on a path towards happiness. It's all about pursuing success, not about managing defeat. And, and Jordan Peterson is about managing defeat. Where was I? <laughs> um, yeah, you should get me on Jordan's, Jordan Peterson's podcast. That would be a lot of fun. I'd love to be on Jordan Peterson's podcast. Um, so what about this benevolence towards other people, being friendly, being kind, being nice, uh, being charitable? Why? What is it about opening a door to somebody, saying hello to the stranger in the street, good morning, you know, I often say good morning to people walking out, or just a nod and a smile. I mean, why? What's in it for you? If somebody falls down, you go and you check up on them, you make sure they're okay, you, you offer some help. Why? We talked about pets earlier. And, and, and you know, pets are, animals are living things, and living things are value. Life is a value. If, if you value yourself, you're valuing life and, and how amazing life is and how wonderful it is for you. For me, life more broadly is a value. I like to see living things thrive and succeed. I love to see success elsewhere because that 
reinforces this empirical idea, empirical knowledge that I have. That life is about success. Life is about happiness. Life is about progress. And I don't like to see failure and, and suffering because I value life. So if at very little effort to myself, I can put a smile on somebody else's face and move them just an iota closer to being happy, successful in some little way, that makes it me a little bit happier because I've just seen another instant of that ability to be successful in life. If I can hold the door for somebody to walk in, cost me nothing. Now, look, it, it's really important to know the context, right? If you stop to open the door to a, for a stranger, in the middle of an emergency, a medical emergency to your kid, which you should be rushing them to the hospital, and instead you stop to open the door for somebody or to help somebody who's just fallen, then you're screwed up. Be benevolent is not to sacrifice. The whole idea of benevolence is a small cost, bigger benefit. Hold the door to somebody, they smile back at you. It's just pleasant. It reaffirms the value of life, the value of a smile, the value of, of, of positivity, of being positive. Hasn't cost you anything, or hasn't cost you much. And the same thing is true, uh, you know, it's, it's, so in that sense, it's selfish. You're getting something out of it. And you never know, you know, you might, uh, you know, say good morning to some stranger and they might answer you and you might start a, start a conversation as a consequence and you might discover a friend. Now, a friend is a huge value. And, and hard to find, and where? And how are you gonna find friends if you're not going to be responsive and in a sense kind and benevolent? You might find the next, your next employer. You might find the love of your life. Again, benevolence is not, somebody says zero sum, it's not zero sum. Apollo says to stupid zero sum ideology. That's right. It's not zero sum. To, to, to benefit others benefits you up to a point, right? There's a point at which it stops. Again, if opening the door is a sacrifice because you're giving up something greater than what you're going to get, don't do it. But most days, 99% of the time, it's just a moment. I'm not in that much of a rush. I get a smile back or a thank you back, and on we go. And it reinforces this idea that we're all human. People are basically good. Life is good. Happiness, well, not happiness, but, but positivity is possible. And of course, that's the kind of world you want to live. You want to live in a world in which people are nice to one another, they're holding doors to one another, they're benevolent to one another. They're not obnoxious and angry and, and yelling and unpleasant. I mean, think about the stress that when you meet somebody like that causes you. You don't want to be close to people like that. And if you're that person, people don't want to be close to you. And if other people are value to you, if they are trading potential, friendship potential, romantic potential, employer potential, employee potential, why do it? It's all negative. Right. So, you know, I don't want to be all Talmud on you. Benny 1776 says this is Talmud, right? Getting a person to smile can change their lives. Maybe it can, maybe it can't. I don't know. You know, a lot of times people have made me smile and it didn't change my life. So it's, it's not the point. I'm not trying to change somebody's life. I'm trying to create for myself a more pleasant environment in which to live. I'm trying to create for myself more positive interactions with other people that have the potential to be win-win. 
Ginger, thank you. That is very, very generous and benevolent. I really appreciate that. Uh, Ginger just gave $100 and put us well over the $600. So we're now basically at $691, so almost at $700. So if, if we want to go to $1,000, tonight might be the night. You know, We might try to do it again on New Year's Eve, but tonight might be the night. And I don't know why Nikoka wants to give me the Communist Manifesto for Christmas. I'm not sure why that is, uh, that is interesting. But of course, there's a limit to how kind you want to be to strangers. There's a limit to how much charity you're going to give. You know, Ayn Rand writes about charity that it's, yeah, it's just not that important. Benevolence, charity are minor virtues under the category generally of justice, the category of how you treat other people. But it's certainly not a moral duty. It's not what gets you moral credit. It's not what makes you a good person. But help other person, particularly if they're worthy of help, or maybe, you know, they're not unworthy. <laughs> so you never want to help somebody who is unworthy of your help. So Ayn Rand writes, I regard charity as a marginal issue. What I'm fighting is the idea that charity is a moral duty and a primary virtue. So benevolence, charity, it's, it's a minor virtue. It's an aspect of justice. You want to help people who deserve your help, who are basically good people. You want to give most people the benefit of the doubt. There's no reason to assume somebody's bad without having any facts to base it on, any evidence to base it on, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, the sad thing is that altruism is what makes us malevolent. Because altruism demands that I sacrifice for you. So I resent you because I'm sacrificing for you. Or maybe I'm not sacrificing for you, but I resent you because I know I'm supposed to sacrifice for you. And the fact that I'm supposed to sacrifice for you makes me feel guilty that I'm not. So a whole interaction before we even get started is a negative one, is one that is emotionally draining on me. I either feel guilty or I feel resentment. Whereas if you're rationally and self-interested, your whole interaction with other people is a values-based one. What value do they have to offer me? What values do I have to offer them? How do we exchange? How do we get a trade here? I'll open the door. Maybe they'll smile. Maybe they say thank you. Maybe not. But, you know, no, no big deal. Altruism makes us malevolent. I mean, uh, this point is not mine. Uh, again, if, if, if you want, you can, you can read in, in uh, Ayn Rand. She says, the fact that a, that a man has no claim on others, that is not their moral duty to help him, and that he cannot demand their help as his right, does not preclude or prohibit goodwill among men, and does not make it immoral to offer or accept voluntary, non-sacrificial assistance. It is altruism that has corrupted and perverted human benevolence by regarding the giver as an object of immolation and the receiver as a helpless, miserable object of pity who holds a mortgage on the lives of others, a doctrine which is extremely offensive to both parties, leaving men no choice but the roles of sacrificial victim or moral cannibal. God, she could write. To view the question in its proper perspective, one must begin by rejecting altruism's terms and all of its ugly emotional aftertaste. Then take a fresh look at human relationships. It is morally proper to accept help when it is offered, not as a moral duty, but as an act of goodwill and generosity. When the giver can afford, that is, when it does not involve self-sacrifice on his part, and when it is offered in response to the receiver's virtues, 
not in response to his flaws. Uh, flaws, weaknesses, or moral failure. And not on the grounds of his needs as such. Now, that's brilliant. That's from the question of scholarships uh, in The Objectivist of June 1966. All right, so I am open to questions on these topics. Uh, jump in. We've got a lot of good questions already. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, go down the list. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on... Uh, on um, the ones that will lead to benevolence now, and then we'll, we'll get to the other ones afterwards. Okay, Shazbot asks, can you discuss how benevolence relates to owning and caring for pets? Oh, I did, I think. And perhaps compare this to saving endangered species. Look, I think with regard to pets, um, I, you know, I don't have pets, so this is all kind of, uh, this is not, from my personal experience, from people I know and I see around me. Pets provide you with a real value. They, you know, the, the, the way they, uh, they respond to you, the way they reflect back to you certain emotions, they are obviously, because I know people who own pets and love their pets, really invoke love and, and a deep, deep, emotional response. So I think that goes way beyond benevolence. That goes to a, a, a special relationship between two living, conscious beings that I might not understand because I'm not a pet owner, but the owners of pets get deep, deep, real satisfaction from, real joy from. And it's the interaction of those consciousness. It's, 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 an interaction of the, 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 the values, the, the, the emotional response that, that is incredibly powerful. And, you know, you'd have to ask somebody who owns pets to, to articulate this better than me because, again, I don't have that experience. But clearly, it's an enormous value to people. Now, I don't know how that relates to endangered species. All I can say is if you love animals, if you care for animals, again, because you care for life, you might want to help preserve certain species. But, uh, you know, some endangered species, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I don't know. that it, it depends on the context, right? It, it, you know, if the desert rat is, I don't know, uh, coming into my house and eating my garbage or whatever, I don't care if he's endangered. I want him out. I want him away. I want him dead. So I, I, you have to think about the specific value, the specific animal or type of animal produces for you, the fact that they're endangered or not is not of primary relevance. It's, again, the value that life form has to you. And rationally, what is that value? Uh, let's see. Uh, Dave asks, how do you stay open and benevolent with people when in today's context so many people view kindness as weakness and will use it against you? Or they feel resentment when you're happy and they're miserable? Well, you try not to deal with people like that. You try to distance yourself as quickly as possible from people like that. Th that is destructive. People like that are destructive. I mean, if somebody wants to view my kindness as weakness, then to hell with them. I'm not going to be kind to them for very long. Right? Benevolence is not unconditional. Benevolence is not to everybody. It's only to strangers who have no reason to think are bad people. But once I know you're a, ca you're a nasty character, I'm not kind to you. I'm not going to be nice to you. I'm not, you know, I've, I've said before, I'm a big believer in hate. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in in being objective about people. And if people are nasty, then being, you know, you, you got to take that into account. Don't pretend they're not. Gail, thank you. Merry Christmas to you too. So if somebody resents that I'm happy, then 
I don't want to have anything to do with them. And that's how you stay benevolent. You stay open benevolent by constantly focusing on who are the people they're interacting with. And as soon as they disqualify themselves from being my, for be, having a relationship, positive relationship with me, then I stop being benevolent towards them. I only am benevolent to people I don't know that they're like this. If they're like this, I'm not benevolent to them anymore. Uh, oh, yeah, let's see. Um, I feel I need to be benevolent to be happy. But there's an issue of justice here because most people today don't deserve the positive energy I'm giving up. Irrational cultures are no win-win situations. Everyone suffers. That's true. But you can't give in to that. I still think that we still live in a place where, for the most part, you can assume that people are good. You can act as if people are good. And yes, you'll be disappointed more often than you should be. And then you adjust based on the virtue of justice. You adjust your behavior. It's my answer to Dave. You adjust your behavior based on the evidence you receive from them, from about particular individuals. But I'm not willing to give up on human beings. I'm not giving, willing to give up on the ability to be happy and be successful and, and provide me with values. So yes, I may be a little bit more cautious because I live in a culture in which there are fewer people that are good. But I'm not willing to assume a stranger who I know nothing about is bad just because the odds have gotten worse because of the culture we live in. Certainly there is a culture where things are so bad that I, I, I you know, look through the people before I open the door and I have a gun in my hand in case if it's a stranger. But that's not a world I want to live in. It's not a world I want to live in. It's like I don't want to live in a world in which people are walking around armed in the streets. It's not a world I want to live in. It's a bit scary. So in a world which is not there yet, uh, I think you can still be pretty benevolent towards people and most people will, you know, not... Uh, what do you call it? Betray that. Will not betray that. All right. Um, do you feel there's not enough benevolence in work environments today? Employees are jealous, gossipy, and think they have to be at war with each other. Was ARI a benevolent work environment when you were there? I think it was. I mean, I, I, I was pretty benevolent, and I, I think it was. You'd have to ask the employees if, what they thought, but uh, I think so. I don't know if work environments today are not benevolent. Um, that would be sad because you're all engaged in a, in a, in a workplace. You're all engaged in the same productive activity you, you, or you're engaged in productive activity for, the, for, this, for, for a common goal, for a common purpose. Uh, it should be a place with extreme benevolence. Uh, it, to some extent, you're dependent on your coworkers because of division of labor. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. But again, it, 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 it flourishes under a benevolent scenario and, and, and it's a disaster when it's not. A capitalist next asks, Elon Musk, do you want a humorless society that is rife with condemnation and hate? Uh, I don't know, are you quoting him? At its heart, wokeness is divisive, exclusionary, hateful. It gives mean people a shield to be mean and cool, armored in false virtue. I think that's absolutely right. Wokeness, but more broadly, altruism. Wokeness is just one form. Is divisive, exclusionary, hateful, placing people against people, um, zero-sum game or negative-sum game. They are winners and losers, sacrifices and sacrifice to altruism, wokeness, all of these are, yeah, they're, they're really mean and cool and, and, and really bad. And if Elon Musk said that about wokeness, good for Elon Musk. He's, he's getting better by the minute. Maybe he's listening to your Ron Book Show. I mean, who knows? Maybe. When James Taggart catches a cold and damns the universe, 
Is he reacting as if his suffering is a metaphysical manifestation? Yes. As if there's meaning to his suffering, that suffering is uh, 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 outside of his control, but more than that, that it is, that it is inherent in the universe, that it is fixed against him in some way. And that is, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical thing, right? Now, of course, James Taggart is never happy. So he never experiences the opposite of the suffering. Um, but yes, he damns the universe because, uh, you know, he hates life. He hates reality. He hates the world. You know, if you get a cold and it sucks, you go, it sucks. You know, viruses are out there. I'm going to get a virus once in a while. It's part of life. It's not that important. I'll get over this. And I go on. But when you go, oh, you know, life is horrible. The universe is against me. That says something about your psychology. And it says something about your world. And it says something, your view, your metaphysical view of living. Of living. He's giving his suffering metaphysical weight. Metaphysical importance that it just doesn't have and that the heroes in Atlas never do. And I think she has James Taggart do that in the novel to contrast with the heroes who don't let suffering have any metaphysical importance in their lives. All right, let's see. Uh, where are we in terms of... Uh, we're about 7.55, uh, so about two two forty five from a thousand dollars. I don't know if we'll make it, but uh, maybe if somebody if somebody is is uh, would like to help us get there, that'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, we we have a few more super chat questions. I'm going to go over them uh, primarily the twenty dollar. Yeah, we'll do all of them. Most of them are twenty dollar ones. You you guys were great today. Almost all the questions were twenty dollar questions. Uh, Yash asks, if there is to be a standard of value at all, it must be life. That's right. I understand that argument. But is there a rational reason to say that one must choose their own life over death? Not in terms of values. In terms of life and everything you're giving up by giving up on life. But there's no, you know, there's no, um, I mean, if somebody's suicidal, you can, you, can, you can reason with them about the potential for happiness, the potential for success, the beauty that is life, the beauty that is being alive, the pleasure, the joy. So you can argue for life. But if they don't care about the beauty, if they don't care about joy, if they don't care about happiness, if none of those things, because they don't care about life, then it's gone. You, you know, you, you can only argue there in the context of life because they are alive. So that context exists for them. There's still a sliver that they could change their mind, that they could change their mind about it. But, you know, it, it, I think very few people choose consciously not to live. I think people choose to live and then default on the responsibility of doing it. They choose to live and then default on choosing and fighting for the values that are necessary in order to be alive, in order to thrive as a human being. Does that make sense, Yash? Yes, Yash? I don't have pronounce. Um... Ooh, I, I almost missed this flood. Any question? Uh, copy. Okay, let's... Fend Harper asks, morality versus immorality versus amorality. Defining the good and choosing it versus defining the good and choosing the bad versus morality is non-applicable. I think it's immoral to advocate for morality and vote for amorality. I don't know what voting for amorality is. I don't know what that means exactly. 
So the aim all is, is things that, you know, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? That's not a moral question. It's not an amoral question. It has no applicability. Right? Um, they're just optional values in life. They're optional values in life that are either moral or amoral. They're amoral. They're, they're not moving you towards life or towards death. That's amoral. But I don't understand what it means to advocate for morality and vote for amorality. You'll have to explain that to me, Finn Hopper. Like social programs that help everyone. Oh, so you're voting for something that's amoral, but, but actually social programs that help everyone are amoral. So I, I, I guess I'm still not quite understanding. Um... Oh, wow. All right, I'm going now to just your general questions, so this don't have necessarily anything to do with, um, with uh, morality. This is an interesting one, and I don't know if I have an answer to it. What evidence would be required to prove the objective reality of transgenderism, i.e. a woman can be born in a man's body? I don't even think, I mean, I don't really think that that's the right way to conceive of it. <sighs> of transgenderism. I don't, I don't think that you could be a woman born in a man's body in, in that sense. <sighs> so what would you have to do? You'd have to know what it means to be a woman. What are the psychological, hormonal, characteristics of being a woman versus being a man, right, that are independent of your physiology, right? So is there such a thing as being a woman independent of a woman's physiology? Now, it certainly can be the case that people can be psychologically confused, psychologically wrong, uh, psychologically uh, uh, um, uh, somehow the wires are off, and they in some way feel like a woman. But what would that mean to be born that way? I don't know that you can um, be born with a gender separate from a biology. I think you can develop, a for whatever, for whatever psychological reasons, an affiliation with a gender different than what you have. But I think that comes after birth. It, it's not something that's embedded in you. Now, to show that it was embedded in you, you'd have to have a this understanding and this of, of what it meant. I don't know what it means to say you're a woman born in a man's body. I, I don't know what woman they refers to. What are you referring to? So it's that kind of knowledge we would have to have. We'd have to be very careful in determining, in defining our terms. So I think transgenderism is real as a psychological phenomenon. I doubt very much it's real as a biological phenomenon. That is, as a phenomenon you're born with somehow. Yes. And, and, and it's certainly true, for example, I think particularly with girls, because maybe the way women are treated differently than boys, and boys, particularly when we're young, have a lot more fun than girls, I think. They're allowed more freedom. They're allowed to be more physical. And some girls want to be physical, and they want that freedom. And that's, we have a term, a tomboy. And, and, and those girls resent being a girl, and they resent... The, you know, the, being treated like a girl and having to dress up like a girl and they want to roll around in the mud with, with the boys and, and, and that's completely natural and I think a lot of girls are like that. But then at some point when the manifestations of the biology come to the forefront during puberty, that all changes. And, and I think if they're psychologically healthy 
And maybe if they're biologically healthy, maybe there's a biological aspect to this. They embrace their femininity. They embrace their womanhood. They embrace what it means to be a woman. But uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, there's something off. There's something psychologically or maybe physiologically off with feeling, you know, with, with being in a, in, in, you know, feeling like a woman in a man's body or some, or the opposite. Um, I think that's more psychological than anything else. But in order to prove it, you'd have to really carefully define all these terms, the evidence you'd have to, you'd have to really work through what kind of evidence suggests that a woman is however you want to define it. Uh, what is a man? Where does a feeling like that come from? Where do these kind of feelings e even, where do they exist from? How much of it again is physiological versus psychological? Um, so you'd have to know a lot more than I know and that I think generally is known about these things to figure that out. Okay, I think... Um, Friend Hopper, I think, is trying to clarify the question from before. I mean that the law, law that makes everyone sacrifice makes the good that comes from it not up to everyone's free, voluntary... Not up to everyone's free, voluntary will to help. The help we are forced to give is amoral help. Why is it amoral? I'm not sure it's amoral. That, 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 you know, that our sacrifices are emo. Why, why wouldn't they be emo? And that the good that comes of it is not really good. That the help is emo because it's forced and or it's, it's based on altruism and therefore it's emo. And that the good co comes of it is, is bad because it's not really good. Let me know if you have a follow-up on that. All right, let's go down these uh, in order. Michael says, Merry Christmas, great show topic. What's the best way not to be a prisoner of your past without repressing emotions? Well, it's to understand the emotions, to figure out their source, to think it through, to, to challenge you the conclusions that those emotions came from, assuming... Th those emotions are negative, right? Or, or those emotions are unjustified. So you're not a prisoner to the past if you hold certain emotions about that, that come from the past that are consistent with reality. Then that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So the problem is what happens when you have emotions um, that are inconsistent and uh, that you want to move on from. And you don't want to repress them, but you want to move on from them. What you need is to understand them, think them through, come up with an alternative, right? So uh, the more you understand, the more you think about your emotions, you understand their source, you understand their origin, you understand the conclusions that led to them, the more you undo them and undo this oppressive influence they might have on you. Uh, a friend Albert says, it's immoral that they exist, but we can't take pride from its cause. That's right, because we didn't choose it. That's right. That's right. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, Thomas asks, have you, uh, you've been talking about San Francisco homeless issue but never raise what sounds like a big part of it, the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill from the late 1960s on. Isn't that a big part of the problem? It is, uh, but I don't exactly know what to do about it. That is, I, I, I haven't thought it through and I haven't seen anybody really write or think about it in a way that makes sense to me. Okay, so what are you supposed to do with somebody who's mentally ill? Should the state take responsibility for that person? Um, is there a state budget for that? Is it voluntary, but then should the state use 
it's cause of uh, to put people in such institutions? Um, is it voluntary? Who is in charge of that voluntary decision? Is it the mentally damaged person or is it their relatives? How mentally damaged do you have to be in order to lose your ability to make that choice? So I, I, so I avoid the topic because I don't know the answer to those questions and they're complicated questions. The answer is not obvious to me. So I, you're absolutely right in the sense that it's a big cause of homelessness. I don't think it's the priminess of a cause of homelessness, but it is a big one. And I don't know exactly how, to, how, how you deal with it in a free society. Um, I'm curious what others think about, about it. Ian asks, Merry Christmas. Did you know there's a new Cyrano movie coming out in 2021 starring Peter Dinklage? Sounds pretty benevolent. I'm having a hard time with the Cyrano. I really am. I mean, I like Peter Dinklage, you know, in, in roles like uh, in, um, what was the fantasy thing? Um, I, I think he's a good actor, I, you know, but... I don't see him as Cyrano. I don't know how he can be Cyrano. Cyrano is a man of action. Cyrano is a fighter, a warrior, brave, courageous, hero, heroic, physically robust, who has a deformity. But can Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage is a I don't know what the technical, politically correct term for it. What is it? Height challenged or whatever. He's he's a dwarf, right? I don't know how Peter Dinklage can portray heroism in action, great swordsmanship. I mean, he could be strong. He could be brave. He could be courageous. But can he really be a warrior? which is what Cyrano is. So they have to really change the story in some important way. They have to really change the perspective of Cyrano. So, I mean, you can be, you can be, you, can, you know, you could have one, you could have lots of deformities that can happen, but stature, you know, I just don't see it. I don't see how you can be a warrior and be really, 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 really short. I, I, I don't see how that works. Now, maybe, maybe there's a way in which they get away with it in the Cyrano movie. I just don't know how. Oh, God, I'm supposed to do the review of the... Okay, we'll do that as well um, at the end. So if Shazbot is here, we're going we're gonna to do um, Measure of a Man at the end. I hope you're here. So I'm, I, I watched the Cyrano movie. Um, there's also a new, uh, I'm, I'm more excited actually for the new Macbeth, even though Macbeth is a horrible story. It's a great story. And um, uh, they've got Denzel Washington, one of my all-time favorite actors, uh, doing the part of, of Macbeth. And uh, it's, it's directed by Joel, um, Joel Cohen from the Cohen Brothers. Uh, in black and white, it looks fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to Macbeth. I hope, I hope they do a good Cyrano. A Cyrano I can, I can enjoy. That they don't turn it into a joke, which is the danger. Uh, Shazbot asks, do you consider Roxanne starring uh, Steve Martin to be good adaptation? Yeah, I think so. It's not trying to stay close to the original. That's why it succeeds. It's, uh, it's, 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 you know, funnier. It's, and I can't remember how it ends. I guess it's, I can't remember. I guess it's not tragic ending. I guess it ends in a happy ending. So it's, it's, it's a fun adaptation. It's obviously not Cyrano. It doesn't live up to being Cyrano. But it doesn't, it doesn't pretend to be Cyrano. It's Roxanne. So it doesn't call itself Cyrano. It, 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 it set him on in times. It, it, he's a firefighter. He, it, you know, it's, it's lighthearted. It's, got a, it's, it's cute, right? It, but it's well done. But it's a complete adaptation. It's not, it's not Cyrano. 
Oh, the, the, the new Cyrano is a musical. So that's also going to be interesting. I don't know. It just seems like a caricature. Now, maybe they can pull it off. And I like the Coen brothers. I mean, they're weird, super weird. But I like the Coen brothers. But, oh, no, uh, Cyrano's not the Coen brothers. Cyrano's C- somebody else. I'm getting them all confused now. So I, I, I don't know what I will see about Cyrano. Ask me after I've watched it. I'm suspicious. Uh, Michael says, I'm happy to see the objectives moving, growing more intense and passionate, even if our numbers are growing slower than expected. Quality over quantity here. I agree. Uh, have you ever been set up on an interview you thought was legitimate? I guess I'm not sure what that means. Do you mean illegitimate? I don't know what the question is. Uh, all right. Uh, Flo- uh, let's see. Frank asks, in the Fountainhead, Ellsworth Tui says, I play the stock market of the spirit. I sell short. Could you please comment on what this means? It means he's betting on failure. He's betting on disaster. He's betting on to sell a stock short. You're basically saying, I am putting my money on this stock, this company failing. Ellsworth Turing is betting on the human spirit that it will fail, that it will, that it will self-destruct. He gains when other people lose. It's another way of thinking of it. Uh, Florida Nick, did you ever get a drone? I just got my first hobby grade RC truck and I'm loving it. I did get a drone. I flew it like twice and I'm bored with it. So it's, I'm not good with these things. I mean, I, I got it for like Christmas two years ago, three years ago. And I went out and I, I can't, uh, I can't actually use it right next to the house because we're close to an airport and it won't actually launch close to an airport. Um, but, uh, you know, I got bored with it pretty quickly. So I had a drive to play with it. I, I drove up, played with it a little bit. Okay, I see. It goes like this. And then I got bored with it. I, I didn't try to take great photos. and You know, I didn't really get into it. I guess you have to get into it to really enjoy it. Okay, I think we're done. We've got Stephen. Stephen just asked, what did you think of the 1990s Gerard de Perdue version of Cyrano? I remember Leonard Peikoff not liking it, but he didn't really get into why. Yeah, I also remember Leonard not liking it. And I think it's primarily because he, Gerard de Perdue did not play it as this hero of action. I think that's, that's why. Um, you know, I think he was a little overweight. I, I, you know, he had a little bit of a smoke on his face. I, I mean, I, I actually liked it. I like Gerard de Padua. I like almost everything he's done. But um, I get it. I mean, I think Leonard would be horrified by this idea of a Cyrano with, with a dwarf in it. Are you allowed to say dwarf? Is that legit? Um, I, I just don't see how that's... How, you know, I don't, I think that undermines what Cyrano is. Cyrano has a deformity. On, but everything else is almost perfection. And here, the, the, the deformity is much more. And it, and it has to affect his ability to be heroic and, and, and physical and, and, and a great warrior. Anyway, I'm repeating myself. Um, I enjoyed uh, Jean de Perdue again because I, I, I like him and, and I like his acting but I, I get he's a lot less heroic than the classical Cyrano uh, acted in, in, by uh, Leonard's favorite Cyrano if I remember right was um, God I can see the actor's face and I can't remember his name but he's an, a, 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 um, I mean, Carrera, who was in the original movie, is very good. But uh, Leonard saw the, uh, another Cyrano on stage with this other actor who he says was the best. Um, and, I, and, and I now forget, I forget his name, but, um, oh God, it's on the tip of my tongue. I'll try to remember it for next time. 
All right, Theme Master, thank you. Really appreciate it. How did we do today? Um, 20, like $840. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we'll have like a, a big fundraising drive on uh, January 30th, not on New Year's Eve, I don't think, because I have to attend a wedding on New Year's Eve and then I've got a, a dinner. So I'll probably do it on, on January 30th. We'll do a year in review and looking forward to 2022. Um, and uh, we'll make that kind of a fundraising event. So if, if you want to give the Iran Book Show significant amounts of money, that's the time to do it. That'll be a good time to do it. We'll try to raise a lot of money. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but that'll be our, our 2021 year in review. Um, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, next show will be on Sunday. Have a December 30th, yes. Have a fantastic Christmas. Fantastic Christmas. Uh, and have a great weekend. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Hope you get the gift you asked for. Uh, Justin asked, what about the black actress playing Anne Boleyn in BBC period piece? I haven't seen it, but I have no problem with a black actress playing Anne Boleyn. I, I don't care that she's black. It doesn't make any difference. Any more than I, that I care that, um, that Macbeth is going to be black in, in the production of Macbeth, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't change. Anne Boleyn was a character. It's what's, what, what, what her personality was. But Cyrano, um, again, was a physical he hero. He was a presence on the battlefield. I, I don't know how you make that. Jose Ferrar is the one who did it in the movie, which, which Leonard really liked. But there was another actor uh, of that generation who Leonard saw on stage. God, it's right down the tip of my tongue that he thought was better. He thought was better than, um, yeah. I mean, I have no problem black actors playing uh, historical figures who were white or, uh, but, 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 they, but I would have a problem for a man playing Anne Boleyn, right? Or, or something like that, right? Yeah, she has to be female. Female is essential. Color of skin is not essential. Se gender is essential. Sex is essential. Color of skin is not essential. I don't know why this is so hard. Can James Bond be a female? No. Everything about James Bond's character is a male character. It's, it's, it's masculine, and it's, it's the attitude towards women, and it's, it's just the attitude. It's, it's a male character. I don't think James Bond can be a female. I think there are real differences between men and women. I don't think there are real differences between blacks and whites. Color skin. It's insignificant. Uh, John, I, I, I answered the question. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry you didn't hear it, but I did answer. Um, I said that I, I didn't remember reading the book. That I vaguely have a recollection of it, but I don't remember enough to comment on it, so I apologize. I put it aside so that if I remember or if I come across it, and, and then I will happy to comment on it, but I just don't remember reading the creature of Jekyll Island. Um, so that is, um, yeah. Sorry, I can't deliver. Oh, I've got, okay, so Shazbat, you're gonna have to wait again. Sorry, uh, it's, it's 10 to 10 here in Puerto Rico and we've gone, oh, Derek Jacoby. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Frank just solved the problem. Uh, Derek Jacoby, who Frank also so Play, uh, saw play Cyrano on Broadway. Leonard Peikoff saw Derek Jacoby play Cyrano on Broadway as well, Frank, and he loved it. At, at least that's my recollection of him telling me that Derek Jacoby was the best Cyrano that he saw. I'm going to wait with the review because I'm too tired. It, we've almost gone two hours. Oh, by the way, just for those of you interested, I did an interview yesterday with uh, Breedlove, Robert Breedlove, the, the Bitcoin guy, uh, two and a half hours. And we're going to do a series of them. And he's going to come out with a series of interviews with me about objectivism. So I'm really excited. He, was, he asked really good questions. It was deep. Um, and it was, we talked mostly about ethics and uh, epistemology. And it was really good. And Simeon de Bourgerac, the play. And uh, I highly recommend uh, when it comes out. I think you'll enjoy it. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Breedlove, uh, Richard Breedlove. 
Um, the actor is Derek Jacoby. He's a British actor. He's, he, he, I, don't, I can't remember what else he was in, but you can look him up. Have a great night, everybody. I will see you all on Sunday. Um, and uh, bring good cheer. Come have fun. We'll make it a light show. Bring lots of $20 questions about favorite this and favorite that. And, and let's make it a fun kind of uh, a fun hangout. Let's all just hang out and have a post-Christmas, a post-opening presents uh, good time. See you Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'm pretty sure that's uh, that's when it is. Let me just check the calendar. Uh, yep, 2 p.m. Eastern time. See you all then. Bye, everybody. Have a great Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone.